in selected novels of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh writing partition. We also have with us Dr. Rikaparna Roy, uh, who is a Kolkata-based uh, critic and academic, and she's also the initiator of the Kolkata Partition Museum. And finally, we also have with us Asha Malhotra, a Delhi-based historian and author whose two books on the history of partition and the legacy of partition has received a lot of critical acclaim. So thank you to all of our guests for joining us today. Um, may I, and we're also being streamed, this event is being streamed live on the ULAB Facebook page and the Daily Star Books Facebook page. Now, this entire event was designed this month um, to commemorate the history of the partition of India. As we know, on the 15th of August, 1947, uh, so since then it has been 75 years today, and we're here to talk about the history of the partition and most importantly, the legacy of the partition, so partition and its aftermath. May I please invite um, our speakers, Professor Syed Firdos and Mr. Shudit Chakravarti to join me on stage. Um, we just want to touch base with our speakers. Are, am I audible? Can we all hear each other? Oh, uh, yes, uh, we can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Professor Fritos, I want to, you know, I want to start with you. Um, usually, you know, we know in the international publishing scene, when we talk about the history of partition, a lot of focus is given on the Western partition and not so much on you know, uh, East Bengal. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your work in that area? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's a wonderful evening. And, uh, although the traffic of uh, uh, the city and, and the rain, uh, but I actually thanks the audience as well to be here, to be with us and, uh, yeah, and all the uh, eminent speakers uh, in, um, online, uh, they're, they're, they're joining here online. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk about my research, and uh, this is um, my research is about um, uh, what what should I say? This is about uh, partition that has taken place in East Bengal, and my main argument is East Bengal has been uh, represented in the partition literature uh, in a particular fashion, in a tailor-made way, and often it has been portrayed from people who had been leaving this Bengal uh, following the partition. So this is interesting that there is a huge uh, debate in the academia that why there is this silence about partition of 1947 uh, in East Bengal. There is no, uh, in East Bengal, uh, the academia or intelligentsia or in public life uh, in East Bengal and uh, in today's Bangladesh, you really do not have, uh, hear much about 1947 partition. So there is a question why, uh, an easy answer is 1971 has taken up all the talking points of history in Bangladesh. 1971 is the moment of the emergence of Bangladesh and that actually definitely takes all other talking points. But then uh, also in the partition studies, in the partition literature, East Bengal was underrepresented. There was this view that when William Van Schendel, uh, many years ago, has uh, their work uh, on, on this issue of partition and border making in the region, and they have talked about um, how partition was focused to the West, to the Punjab, as you say, about, about the Punjab border and, and that thing. Bengal border was there, but focus was on Calcutta, the refugees arrived in Calcutta. Refugees have actually had arrived in many other places as well. In West Bengal, in other places of West Bengal, in distant places, partition had an effect on Assam and Tripura as well, but the focus was entirely upon Calcutta. And East Bengal was not there. The only presence of East Bengal was that East Bengal is that other place where people couldn't be able to stay. East Bengal was an ancestor place, ancestor's place that people had to leave behind. They have to wait uh, uh, through the journey of tears and bloodshed. People had to leave the place. So East Bengal was an other horrific place 
where people couldn't stay. That was the only portrayal of East Bengal. So my emphasis was that is that is a significant, that is a crucial fact that the non-Muslims from East Bengal had to leave before and after partition and decades after partition, they had to leave East Bengal. And uh, the ba Bengali Muslims, the predominant uh, social category in East Bengal, they have uh, they has this historical responsibility uh, for the, uh, behind this exodus. So we can't deny that, that's the historical fact. But my point is, alongside that, there are many other episodes of East Bengal partition that have been so far over there. So one is not only East Bengal is a place that non-Muslim couldn't stay. There are non-Muslims in East Bengal, they had to stay. It was not easy for people that we do, and it was not an easy choice for people. It was not logistically always possible for people. Many people just simply didn't want to leave their ancestral place. Many people actually found that they don't have the uh, like material support, material base to migrate with their families. So there are, we talk about the people, the non-Muslims who had to live in East Bengal, but then there are non-Muslims who had to stay back in East Bengal. Partial literature hardly talk about them. Then there is these episodes that East Bengal was not only a place where people, uh, that people had left, but that is a place where people also came, people like Muslims, either Bengali speaking or non-Bengali speaking from different parts of India, from Uttar Pradesh, from Bihar, from Calcutta, a large, uh, from, from Mushidabad, from Malda, a large number of Muslim, Bengali Muslims and non-Bengali Muslims actually arrived in East Bengal. Partition literature hardly talk about them. And then if we talk, if we consider the aftermaths, the non-Bengali Muslim, the non-Bengali partition migrants who arrived immediately after the partition, they had these trajectories that they thought that they had they had to give up, they had to give up all their belongings and everything behind in Bihar or in Uttar Pradesh. And they were thinking that they came in Pakistan, which would be their new identity, and they will form their new Desh, new country. And and with their utmost sacrifice, they become they want to become identified as the heroes of history. So it was in 47, but by 97, in 1971, this section of non-Bengali Muslims, they become the villains of history in this land. And many of them, uh, Dina Siddiqui has this fascinating uh, piece where uh, actually uh, some camp dweller, Jennifer Camp, we, we say that Jennifer Camp, the camp in the Mohammedpur, the camp dweller was saying that we didn't want to leave the country, but the country left us, the country ab abandoned us. So they came for a country that actually had left them, abandoned them behind. So that was the trajectory of the Bihars. We, until very recently, we, did, we do not hear much about them. Then there is these uh, non-Bengali Muslims who thought that in 47, they become the second, uh, the second great citizen, second, like they, they become the minority on their own land. So at the rise of 1971, they thought that this will be a secular country and they will find their space here. And it's interesting that, you know, after 71, Bangladesh didn't really uh, make that promise of keeping uh, really uh, like uh, secure or really, what should I say, a really livable place for the minorities. So there is all these episodes that had remained ignored in the partition studies. One more thing is the border and border relation and how partition was unfolding over the years along the borderline. So that was another part, like the border violences, the border disputes, the killing, and uh, the state denials. So these are the, when, whenever we talk about Bengal border, we use the impartial literature, there's this concept, they use the porous border, because Punjab border had to be sealed because of the extent of the violence. So Bengal border remained porous, like open. People were allowed to leave in, in 1948, there is this inter-dominion exchange between Nehru and Liyapat Ali Khan, and they have this agreement that Bengal, Bengal border have to, uh, has to remain uh, open so that uh, the landowners, 
can settle their uh, issues. So, but after that, the border remained open. And after many years, when Narendra Modi was uh, on his campaign for the first electoral camp campaign, he was entering to Calcutta and he was saying that the Bangladeshis get ready uh, and you have to leave uh, to Calcutta. And he was actually implying by Bangladesh, he was actually implying the Muslims living in Calcutta. So this is fascinating, you keeping the border open in one hand and follow through. Uh, people are identified as Muslim infiltrators entering from Bangladesh to India. So when we, whenever we talk about uh, partition and its aftermath, we hardly look into this real day. And, and these day, NRC and these things right. in India. So there are a whole lot of things that we should look into East Bengal episodes of partition that had remained overlooked so far. Good, Professor Sai, you laid a fabulous map of uh, the discussion this evening. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Nias, if I could please bring you in, ma'am, uh, into our conversation. Uh, can you hear us, Professor Zaman? Could, yes, can yes, I can, I can. Indeed. So as you as you may have heard, uh, Professor Sai uh, laid out a bit of a map of how partition played out and how partition has been perceived uh, in in East Bengal, for instance, uh, in, in many cases, we take a out that geography uh, of partition for us. Now, as you've written extensively about how partition or how people have written partition in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, uh, uh, as it were, could you share with us uh, your thoughts on how you see this sort of geography of partition that has been mapped out in literature, for instance, which is something that you yourself have. Uh, Done extensive studies on you. Uh, you collected anthologies on this issue. You've studied the novels that have been written, partition novels in the three countries. Could you share some of your thoughts with us, please, ma'am? Thank you very much, and I thank uh, Professor Said for um, laying the ground of this the grounds for this discussion. And I agree with him that um, the partition of 1947. Uh, was sort of eluded uh, in uh, East Pakistan. And, um, and the reason for it is, uh, well, there are, it's very complicated. And um, one of the reasons that I uh, mention in uh, my books um, I've written, I've got uh, a divided legacy, selected novels, a study of selected novels of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And I've also got a collection of short stories on the partition. Um, what I mention is that you see, um, when, when 47 took place, I mean, um, I, and I won't say the partition of India, I will say the partition of, of, of the South, what we say, the South Asian uh, subcontinent, right? Uh, because it was not just uh, India, it was you know, Pakistan and India. Um, in in, in uh, the, what was then East Pakistan, 47 was overtaken almost immediately by the language question and the question of identity. Um, you know, the language question, you know, with, with language identity is involved. So we are Pakistanis, but we are also Bengalis. Now, how different are we from Hindu Bengalis? Are we the same or are we different? How different are we, how similar or different are we from the Pakistanis? Now this language question actually started, you know, even before partition actually took place. And it culminated, we can say in 1952. And with the language movement, you know, I think all question of partition of 47 was forgotten. 52 took up, uh, you know, the, um, and of course, it's, of course, you know, when we talk about writing about things, you know, the villager doesn't write about things. The villager um, exists um, from day to day. Um, and in 47, 48, 49, you know, um, it took a long time for news to percolate to the villages. So we are talking really about the urban elite who are concerned and who were writing about things. And um, 
So when, uh, um, um, you know, so uh, um, the language question um, uh, was foremost in the mind. And um, we do have some novels and short stories from uh, East Pakistan, um, uh, maybe not directly, some directly related to partition, some indirectly related to partition, but which brought in contemporary issues, what it meant in the 60s, what it meant to be an East Pakistani in Pakistan. And um, uh, I would uh, like to, you know, the, uh, of course, in India and Pakistan, um, you know, the, the partition has been very important. Um, every, I think, um, you know, you know, you think about your know, Kushwan Singh, uh, a train to Pakistan. You think about Babsi Sidwa, uh, breaking India or Ice Candy Man. You think about other writers. Um, if you think about, first of all, let us think about Manto, the vignettes that he writes about Patin, the, you know, just short, short paragraphs, uh, um, you know, uh, conveying the horror of partition. Uh, whereas in East Pakistan, it was, it was sort of like forgotten because of the language question, the identity question, and the relationship of the East Bengali to the West Pakistani. Because, uh, um, you know, and this is something which I think East Pakistanis were embarrassed about because it was the, the, the Bengali Muslim who actually um, struggled for partition, struggled for Pakistan. In fact, I would like to uh, digress a bit, if I may, to uh, uh, Sheikh Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. He was not Bangabundu at the time, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's Oshamapto um, Atto Jibani. It's a very interesting um, account and it's been translated into English. And there is a point there which you know, we forget. Uh, when we think about partition uh, and we think about um, uh, you know, the effect of partition in Bengal, we think about direct action day. And uh, I don't think that we have yet uh, come to terms with direct action day because one side of the story, and I was, I was not, I'm older, I think I'm older than any of you here. And I was six years old when uh, partition took place. Um, you know, um, um, my in-laws lived in Kolkata and they, talked about, you know, like my, my husband, he was, he was two years older than he's passed away. His brother who was two years older than him. All these little children, they went out dressed in their best to celebrate direct action day. But then something terrible, terrible, terrible happened. How it happened, I'm sorry, I'm not a historian. I do not know how it happened, but something really terrible happened on direct action day. But it was not supposed to be that terrible thing that happened. Now, why did I bring in Sheikh Mujib and I digressed a bit? Sheikh Mujib Rahman was studying in Kolkata. Uh, he had got married. Um, it was when those days people got married very young, he was studying and he was doing bad. He wasn't studying because he was doing other things. And you know, he went home to his father and it's a beautiful, beautiful book translated beautifully. He went home to his father, he was married. He went to the home uh, and he uh, was very embarrassed. He approached his father and asked his father for some money to, you know, work and do. And his father hesitated for a little while and then told him, I will give you money because the, the boy had no other, he was a boy. He had no other, the youth, he had the young man, he had no other source of income, but by asking his father for money. And his father said, I will give you money, but you have to stop this Pakistan thing. If you stop this Pakistan thing, then I will give you money. And of course, the young man had to swear because his young wife was there. And I can just, all of us can just picture his young wife, you know, what her situation was, you know, dependent on her husband who was dependent on his father. He went back to Kolkata, but you know, you can swear that you will, give up cigarettes, but you don't. He couldn't give up politics. And on direct action day, one of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, when we call him Bangabundu today, 
his duties was to raise the Muslim League flag. And he went with a friend to raise the Muslim League flag. Uh, but you know, uh, how many of us remember that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was also, uh, you know, um, canvassing, was also protesting, was also voicing his feelings for uh, independence and whatever it brought in its wake. We forget that, but you know, history must not be forgotten. But what happened was that afterwards, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, when he came to East Pakistan, he realized that um, you know, the West Pakistanis uh, had just replaced the British. Right. And then he started his struggle for um, you know, better rights, equal rights, better rights for the people of East Pakistan. I am digressing, I'm not talking about partition, but I just thought that I would like to bring up these issues uh, um, which we tend to forget. And I think we are uh, Bengalis, uh, Bengalis or Bangladeshis were embarrassed about the role that they played in the partition. And perhaps it was the language issue, the language question, the identity question, and the embarrassment. The Punjabi did not fight for partition, I'm sorry. He did not fight for partition. Muslim League was not formed in Lahore or Karachi uh, or in that little lonely place, Rawalpindi. It was formed in Dhaka. So, and then of course we have forgotten Muslim League. We deny Muslim League, we, we say it never existed. But, you know, uh, um, you know the, the, the sad thing is that we cannot forget history. I'll stop there because there are others to talk. I'll come back, you know. Absolutely. Make comments. And uh, Professor Diaz, what you term your digression has actually opened up several windows of discussion this evening. So thank you very much for taking us to these places. In fact, if I could bring Anshil in here, because I just want to, uh, uh, because you know, you, Anshil, you are this evening the sole representative of the Western part. So welcome to the East, if you will. Uh, and I, I just want to get your. Uh, reaction, if you will, when you hear about these stories and these tellings of how the East views partition and how the East carries partition uh, with it to this very day. And there are interwoven histories of the birth of Bangladesh, uh, displacement of communities, forgotten histories, so on and so forth. Uh, could you tell us how uh, you see, I mean, what your reaction to the conversation that you've heard thus far, what your reaction to that is, and also take, take us a little bit on your journey as to how, uh, you know, why you do what you do, why you are driven to write about uh, the partition in terms of not uh, necessarily a situation of horror, which is obviously the horror is embedded in partition. We can't really get away from that. But you seem to have traveled almost a light year or two from 1947 to remembering partition in a very tactile way to objects, to memories, to remember histories, and made it actually a very fascinating anthropological study, a historical study, and a study of emotion in some way, if I'm not wrong. So could you share some of that with us? Uh, thanks, Sudeep. Uh, and I'm I guess proud to be the only uh, Punjabi on this panel today, but uh, I think that uh, the first thing I want to say, of course, is that it's very difficult to tell one single partition story. It's very difficult to homogenize the experiences of partition, whether they come from Punjab or Bengal, and we must not ever fall in that danger of thinking there is one kind of story because for too long, there has always been one kind of story that's been told, and that's been a story of either violence or politics. But the danger in telling a partition story only through those two lenses is that it actually completely erases the individual and their individual sacrifices, their individual journeys, their individual voices. So uh, to answer the second part of your question first, that is really what interested me in partition. Um, when I started, and I also realize I'm probably the youngest person on this panel. So when I started, which is nearly a decade ago, it was because the way I had learned about partition in school, and that was really the extent of it, was 
a conversation of numbers and statistics. X number of people had been displaced, X number of people had been killed. And for someone that comes from four grandparents who migrated at the time of partition, and the fact that I didn't know anything about their journeys was quite a shocking uh, thing for me that when I was taught it in school, my first instinct wasn't to come home and say, oh, did you live through this thing called partition? Tell me more about it. My first instinct was to assume that something had happened so far back in history that it couldn't touch me now, couldn't impact me. But I think that um, when I began asking around about partition and I began through the lens of objects because I encountered these very mundane artifacts that had been carried by my family from Lahore to Amritsar and then to Delhi. And they were like a vessel in which glassy is made and a yardstick to measure fabric. They were so mundane. I could have almost ignored them for my entire life. But things that um, my family had been too, had been too difficult to say for them violence that they had witnessed, violence that they had fled, or memories that they had buried of the places where they were born seemed to come out far easier with the aid of an object. When they are touching something, when they are smelling something, the, the feel, the texture, the caress, I think it just inspired someone to say, yes, in my childhood in Lahore, I remember walking the streets and eating this particular thing or drinking this kind of lassi. And, I think that this is generally how subsequent generations are introduced to partition through these vignettes of nostalgia. We are never, we are never really, I think for the most part at least, we are not offered that entire landscape of horror and stories of the past emerge as stories of homelands left behind or things that were left behind or what the family was reduced to after. And it seems that where there is space in language for nostalgia, other things remain mostly absent or disassociated. And it was these other things because nostalgia, like when often when Punjabis speak about West Punjab, and I'm talking specifically uh, Indian Punjabis, it is really the loss of that kind of Edenic space of Lahore, those beautiful orchards of Rawalpindi. And it, it does paint a very immaculately rosy picture of, of the lands that they left behind. But, you know, that's, I always wonder how much of collective memory has become personal memory over time, how much of what people have survivors particularly have read and understood about partition subsequently have impacted their own memories of it. it this is very common but now to your more recent question of listening to stories of bengal one of the main as an oral historian of partition one of the main and someone who comes from a punjabi background very obviously with my name and everything one of the main questions I am asked is why there is a lacuna of voices from the Bengali partition. And I actually don't think there is that because the work is being done at the moment. It is being done. It's, it may exist in academia on this side of the border or that side and may not make its way to traditional publishing or even may not be sensationalized as perhaps the Punjab partition has been over many years. It has, you know, Punjab has kind of overtaken the space of partition. It has been maybe because of the violence or, or the very, very intense violence in a very short period of time, which existed in a very fortified border. Uh, there was earlier mention of a more porous border and that is really on the, on the Bengal side. And that is really what you find when you speak to people about the partition on the East as I have been for many years. Um, there are differences, of course, there are political differences, there are ethnographic differences, there are linguistic differences from the East and the West. But I, I want to clear that there is a lot of work being done on this side and we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't say that there is nothing or uh, because, and, I, and a lot of young people are doing this work. You know, there is a lot of, uh, the passage of memory has happened in families. People are asking, and I think part of it was either the 70th anniversary of the partition of British India or the 50th anniversary of the creation of Bangladesh did 
lead younger people to ask more. Maybe they realize that their grandparents may not be alive for much longer. Maybe it was just casual mentions of villages or cities left on the other side, but there is an active interest of younger people to independently start recording these stories, which I think is, is hugely, um, it's, you know, it gives you a lot of hope that we can come up with an organic archive of these multiple partitions that have disturbed or the land over many years and created these three identities, these three countries that don't have a shared understanding of a history they do share. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I'm also rambling a little bit, so maybe I'll mm -hmm. stop there. <laughs> and mm -hmm. actually, I think Rutuparna can add a lot more because uh, I'm, I'm interested to know what she has to say as well. Well, we all, Rutuparna, we could, we could see you re getting restless over there. In that wonderfully, <laughs> wonderfully colorful uh, living room of yours. So, because as a fellow archivist of partition, and there is a very, I mean, besides all your academic writing and literary writing on partition, you are what you call the initiator of the Kolkata Partition Museum, which is a fascinating project. Uh, could, I mean, jump, I mean, Anshul directed uh, us in the right, the right way. Uh, Please share your thoughts on that, with the partner. I mean, what led you to set up Kolkata Partition Museum? What led you to this archiving exercise? Uh, what thought went to it and what you hope to achieve from it? Uh, thank you so much. Actually, uh, uh, first, thanks for inviting me. And uh, um, before answering you, I would like to actually add on to what Anshul was saying about work being done. Uh, but even before that, I want to uh, uh, express my delight of being in a panel with so many writers I admire. So Professor Zaman, your A Divided Legacy, which I think till date is the most extensive survey of partition literature in the subcontinent. It was a key text for me when I was doing my research. Anshul, uh, Remnants of Partition, you know, I enjoyed at so many levels. First for the stories, uh, poignant, uh, but also the level of language. So, you know, uh, my bread and butter has been literature. I studied, I taught, I researched. So beautifully written, beautiful prose. And I, I was not surprised you got so many nominations uh, for book prizes. I haven't read Professor Fildos. Uh, please uh, pardon my ignorance, but I have watched a film of which you were a part, you associated with Inherited Memories. And I think we have an Amsterdam University connection with Professor Willem Van Schendel, and I think we have common friends as well. Uh, Shudeep's writing, I think Shudeep has uh, um, done Bengalis and not Bengalis, he doesn't use the word non, not Bengali is a big service by writing the, the Bengalis and Plasi. Uh, so this is a privilege. I, I am a literary scholar of partition. So my background is English literature. Uh, so I studied uh, English honors at Presidency and then I was doing my MA uh, in Calcutta University and we had a special paper. I chose Indian writing English, very few did in the late 90s. And, you know, just as Anshul was saying, in school, I was a great lover of history. History was actually my first love, not literature. And I used to mug up with great gusto the syllabus we had on the freedom struggle. And I still feel in my earlier life, you know, I must have been some kind of a revolution. I must have uh, wasted in some jail or something, because even when I think now about them, I see films, I get very emotional. So I used to mug up those things. And much later, I realized that what history books in school gave me was actually facts and uh, facts about the freedom struggle that led to independence. But it is literature that introduced me to partition. And when I was doing Indian writing in English, I uh, uh, specialized, I realized that so many of those novels had partition as its theme. And so when I landed a fellowship soon after I knew what to work on. So my work, my PhD has been on uh, partition fiction in English. I studied a cross section of novels from the mid fifties to the late eighties and basically studied the evolution of the trope of partition in them. Mid fifties because Kushwan Singh's Train to Pakistan was the first English novel uh, uh, to be written on the subject. And in my postdoc, which I did at Leith in Amsterdam, uh, International History of Asian Studies, there I actually worked on West Bengali partition fiction. Unlike uh, Professor Zaman, I didn't have the, you know, I just felt it was too big if I had to deal with both sides. And as a, uh, what was happening is by then, I had, when I was doing my postdoc, I shifted base. I'm basically a Kolkata person, except for 10 years in the Netherlands, 
I'd lived most of my life. I, I was born, I studied, I taught, I married, I wanted to die here. I, I, I'll still die here now. Uh, in the meanwhile, I was in the Netherlands and there, you know, I had an interest in museums, uh, but uh, 10 years of living and traveling in Europe increased that. And it was in a museum visit that the first idea for a partition museum came to me. The year was 2007. I just let my tenure service here to join my husband in the Netherlands. And I was a little, you know, I was a little morose because I was missing out on seminars and conferences in India uh, on the 60th anniversary. And we were in Berlin for a very short trip, uh, just a day. And we took a historical walk, four-hour historical walk. And one of the pauses in that walk was Peter Eisenman's uh, Open Holocaust Memorial, you know. And <clears throat> that shook me in a way that nothing ever did before that. I'd seen Holocaust films, I had read books, but I realized, you know, what art and installation can do, you know, the, uh, uh, the kind of affect is, it has on you. Uh, literature cannot come even close to it. And it, I was very shaken by that because I swore by literature all my life. And here was I, for the first time, I felt that it was inadequate. And also for the first time, it struck me that, okay, Holocaust and partition more or less happened at the same time. You have so many Holocaust memorials. Berlin itself has four or five. Uh, there is Yacht version. There's the one at DC. There are so many others in Europe. So why is it that we do not have any public memorialization? The, the, that thought struck me only there. And that is, uh, and it, also, uh, it also made me realize, you know, we do a lot of seminars and conferences and all that happens after the conferences is conference volumes. So there is no public engagement with partition. So I thought about it, but for the next uh, fast forward nine years, I was too preoccupied with my personal life in a new continent. Uh, fast forward nine years and I seriously began to think about uh, you know, doing something about it. And I undertook, I, I was initially, I, in 2016, I didn't know I would come back in India a year later. I was thinking of a, another postdoctoral project uh, where I would, there, there are very few, you were talking about uh, Professor Firdos and Zama talked about the lacunae, uh, you know, one of the lacunae, lacuna in partition studies in general is that there is very little comparative studies. Partition didn't happen only in the subcontinent, globally, there has been many countries. So I was situated in Europe. So I first thought of doing a, a, a study, a comparative study of, you know, uh, partition museums in the world. So I thought I'll go to Yugoslavia, to Berlin, to Ireland. When, I, when I'm in India, I'll go to, <coughs> you know, during my time here, once a year I came, I'll try and go to Korea, I'll visit Bangladesh, I had plans, but I could only manage Berlin. And there, for the second time, I went again to that memorial, but the two others I saw, uh, a Jewish memorial Berlin, Museum Berlin, which is designed by Peter Eisenman, and which is actually an extension of the <coughs> original historical museum of Berlin that they had, Jewish museum, and uh, something called the Topography of Terror, which was the uh, uh, previous uh, SS headquarters. And it really, really inspired me uh, to work on this. And I was already working towards co-convening a, a conference in 2017 with Professor Shekhar Mandapath and George Shinbukto, uh, uh, 70th anniversary. You know, we all have, again, these conferences. So I presented my findings there and I first broached the idea of a museum in Kolkata. Why Kolkata? Because uh, I felt very strongly that Bengal needs a partition museum of its own. So I broached it to a primarily academic audience, heavy duty historians who felt it's a great idea, but uh, overtly ambitious and also uh, has a lot of political ramifications, et cetera. And the uh, uh, Amritsar Museum had just happened, you know? So my first homework was visiting that. If you'll just give me a second, I'll need to drink a little bit of water. <coughs> If I can just uh, step in here and uh, request you to tell us about what the Kolkata Partition Museum uh, actually showcases at this point of time, because one of the things we are going to be sharing with our audience and our panelists today is that we're going to be sharing, we already have, uh, we, uh, but we're going to do it again, uh, share uh, the, the website and the URLs of both the Partition Museum and the work that you're doing in Kolkata. And also, I'm sure, virtual museum of memory. 
So we would be sharing uh, news of that as well. So if you could respond uh, quickly. Yes, Professor, I, I, I'll do that. I'll do that. So then I will bring Professor Said into a, a fascinating aspect of partition, which we want to, I'm sure all of us would want to read the want to visit are the forgotten stories because there are aspects of Tripura, aspects of Assam. There are many, many exactly. stories that we need to talk about. Uh, maybe we can open windows and doors this evening since we are addressing so many aspects of uh, Pakistan. Yes, so, yes, sure. So, uh, yeah, so Amritsar visit actually uh, made me realize that I'm on the right track because it's a great museum, but the focus is really Punjab. Uh, so there, we have two primary primary aims. The first is, of course, to memorialize the specificity of the Bengal partition. We are all talking about the specificity. It's different from the Punjab. So to memorialize that in the uh, most comprehensive manner possible. But we are also trying to change the partition discourse a bit. So it has always been about rupture, and rightly so, as Anshul was saying. Uh, but you know, so 70 years down the line, we also need 75 years down the line, we also need to think otherwise. So one of our Another important uh, emphasis is to also remember the cultural continuity between the two Bengals. So what we called uh, living heritage, food, fabric, literature, language, the performative arts, this is no, no small thing. We still have that in common. So we, we have a double foresight. One is to memorialize this past and the other is to emphasize this continuing present. And this is what we've been trying to do for the last three years. Our organization is about three years old now, but just a year into our uh, uh, existence, the pandemic happened. So we were forced into a digital mode, but we have had physical events and we, uh, we are trying to emphasize the importance of the arts in preserving cultural memory. So our first major event was a film fest, which included features and documentaries from both sides of the border and had uh, a Bangladeshi filmmakers as our uh, Tanvir Mukammal and Akram Khan as a chief guest. And last year, we had a major art exhibition of uh, like a group show of five contemporary artists and their take on partition, which not many know about. And this year, we are uh, launching a virtual museum uh, at ICCR Kolkata. This is our most ambitious project till now. Why virtual? Number one, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, an Indian architect based in the US, Orgho Jyoti, he had approached us, he wanted to collaborate with us. Uh, so he, he kind of brought a, he offered a dream on a platter. Uh, and I think one of the reasons was because it, it was in 2020 and we we were in, in you know, pand we were into the pandemic and nobody knew when we were gonna come out of it. So the best way of uh, proceeding with our work to do any substantial work was to uh, do something virtual. And a team of 14 members has been working on it uh, from uh, you know, various backgrounds. And we are actually doing a phased launch. In August, we are going to announce ourselves with uh, some, some bit of work. And then later in the year, we are going to complete that. And uh, uh, it's, it's all going to be accessible and it's going to be free, of course. That's wonderful report. And I, I hope that with what you just shared with us, uh, maybe we can sort of transfer some seeds of Contemplation in Dhaka, Bangladesh, other parts of uh, the subcontinent as well. And <laughs> the fine work that you and Anshul are doing and the Amritsar. I, I just want to add one more thing. You know, one of the things that uh, we are trying to emphasize uh, is migration happened in many other places outside West Bengal, right? So Assam, Tripura, Dondokarono, uh, 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 the Andamans. So we are we are doing an independent oral history project. Uh, there are like five interns who have been working, who have been sharing our, their work with us. So we are going to focus on on certain things that have not been as much prioritized before. And Anshul is absolutely right. The lot of work is happening on these new areas, you know. So it's not true that uh, we don't have work. Yeah. Excellent. In fact, Ritupana, thank you very much for setting the stage to bring Professor Said back because I want to request you, Professor, to uh, talk a little bit about this forgotten partition, the people know the effects of partition, which sometimes uh, we ignore since we have the the time, we haven't heard of it. One, uh, just two quick examples, and then I'll keep the floor to you to take the story ahead. Uh, Ripura, for instance, on account of partition. And the horrors left behind, but there's been an immense demographic change in Tripura, where it's gone from uh, sort of a, a, a Tripuri identity to a 70% Bengali identity on account of partition and subsequent migrations. Uh, that's a story that's not often told. There is an aspect in Assam, uh, in India, where uh, on account of partition, you had 
a Bengali, which is today three districts of, of majority Bengali people foisted on Assam, which led to ironically its own language movement and its own uh, language martyrs. Uh, you in Bangladesh, you have uh, Ekushe. In Assam, you have Unishe. Uh, yeah. The 19th of May, 1961. For instance, so could you talk to us about some of these unintended uh, effects of partition, if you will, I mean, away from the horror and the stories and the histories? Uh, could, you, could you share some of your thoughts with us? Uh, thank you, Sudeep. Uh, actually, this is uh, the conversation, the way it, it has been imagining this thing is fascinating. And I really appreciate that people from diverse background and diverse interests as well and ex-parties as well uh, are presenting their work. Uh, although Rita Parna is not familiar with my work, but I am familiar with her book. Uh, and I, so I refer that as well. Um, and yes, um, I was supposed to do uh, just, just a personal note. I was supposed to conduct this research in 2003 or four, but then there is this hor uh, horrible thing happened with me like this uh, peripheral neuropathy, which made me uh, in a state of quadriplasia for a year. So I had to give up doing work with William. The proposal was developed with William French Scandal. But then I have to conduct the study after uh, like eight years, uh, seven years, I have to resume the work in UK with somebody else. He's a uh, cultural historian here at Sarah. Anyway, uh, uh, yes, um, there are actually, uh, uh, the unintended consequences. Partition is all about unintended consequences. Like, uh, I am not sure how many of this uh, floor actually is aware of the fact that the countries were declared independent in 14th August and 15th August. Border was declared in 17th August. Border was made public in 17th of August. So consider the misery along the border line. People were thinking that they may end up in Pakistan, but they all of a sudden they discover, discovered them as part of India. Like these things happen on both sides of the border. And there is this huge confusion because people had been asked to cast their vote like a referendum uh, in which part the local wants to be in. So uh, I had conducted my field work in um, the uh, locality named Dili. In uh, under the district of Dinaspur in our part, and that is just uh, next to the uh, Hili and Balukhat, like uh, at uh, southern Dinaspur, uh, India. So um, there is this uh, like people who are considering that in the referendum they have voted for Pakistan with huge majority, and they were expecting that Hili will be the part of Pakistan. All of a sudden, after the border had been declared, after one or two days, they came to know that Hili is bifurcated. And the town township of the Hili, uh, that part actually now belongs to India. And the rural area, rural Hili, is part of uh, is Pakistan. So the people had uh, livelihoods, uh, divided livelihoods, lives, families, etc. And then people has this huge mistrust among the community. Like, we are supposed to be part of Pakistan. How come it happened? So if you go to a Hili today, you will find these absurd, unreal, make-believe stories that there's this conspiracy from the Hindus and the Hindu leaders, and there's some local Muslim leaders are part of that in dealing, and India had taken away this part of our land. So these absurd stories are, and people, these are not real stories. Like they say, is, okay, there is this curse on this particular guy, the Muslim political leader who actually uh, collaborated with the Hindu leaders to take away most of the part of Hili in, in India. And when he was pointing out that, that this is this should be the borderline, his hand became crippled. So this story, this is unreal. You uh, uh, like. As you, you don't believe it, I don't believe it, but people believe it. And this is fascinating as an anthropologist. I was working uh, in the large zone of social history and anthropology. So for me, this is interesting. How come such an unreal story survived all through these years? Because this is historical. This is elements of history and this mistrust, this uh, like um, uh, distance between the communities. It's a historical shape. So this is very important. So. Uh, 
But I would like to I would take this opportunity to add two more points about uh, what had been uh, disregarded so far in, in partial studies. Number one, as I said, the partial studies is all about monopolization or absolutization of loss. Partition is horrific even. It's about loss. It's about sadness. It's about death. It's about rape. It's about looting, arson. But at the same time, for East Bengal, partition was a moment of joy and hope. It's a moment of assertion of new identity, emergence of new Muslim identity. And then uh, if you look at Nilej Bosch's work, Nilej Bosch uh, has this fascinating article named uh, Pakistan Jindabad. He's saying that Bengali Muslim intelligentsia, Calcutta-centric Bengali Muslim intelligentsia was considering that a new identity of Bengali Muslim should have to be formed, which will be Pakistani, but is Pakistani. And at the same time, they will be Bengali. So there is this Farooq Ahmed, there is this, uh, all this literary, uh, like uh, uh, Akram Khan, and like uh, these, all, all of their works and fascinating works, like they were crafting a new identity from, that started from 1937. So there was this moment of like my personal story. My father was uh, a, a person from this part, like he, he was from Chapaina uh, the this, the newly formed district now, but uh, his education, his childhood was in Malta. He was rare because my grandfather was uh, doing job there. So he uh, graduated from Malda School and College. And then in, in the early 40s or late 30s, uh, at the end of 30s, he entered Dhaka University. Although my Fubu, my paternal aunt, he had his, her, she had her education in Calcutta. She started uh, undergrad in Bethlehem College. So why for my father, the decision was Dhaka because the drum meeting has already been there within the community. That, Things are coming up. So my father moved in Dhaka. And after completion of uh, 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 his master's from Dhaka University, he again went back in Malda with the degree of, his, uh, of, an, uh, like, uh, of uh, Dhaka University. He started job in Malda. And he was doing job in Malda, but after partition, he was started looking job in this side. So when he came in this side, he got a job in a century-old college in Papa, Papa Edward College. Pabna and College was full of Hindu professors. And when my father joined, many of them were actually departing. And that opened uh, an opportunity for my, my father. Only on the second year of his career, he became the vice principal of that, of that century old college. And then soon he was promoted as a principal and carried in for the next 10 years. So Bengali Muslim had this moment of achievement, joy, celebration that was short-lived. That was Muslim League was not fair with us. Uh, West Pakistan was not fair with us, but there was this short-lived, like as Ahmed Kamal used it, as Dina Siddiqui quoted Ahmed Kamal, that East Pakistan, in East Pakistan, many perceived that it was a land of eternal being. And when I talked to Hili, Hili people, they say they had this, Tremendous enthusiasm. They were parading uh, uh, to protect the border with empty hand. They had nothing. Uh, the entire village has nothing to protect the border, but the volunteers were marching along the borderline every morning and every evening. So there is this enthusiasm in the. Uh, uh, so absolutization of lo loss is important. Loss is undeniable. But absolutization and monopolization of loss is something which should be reconsidered in partition studies. The other part is, uh, uh, which I should say, that nationalization of nostalgia. As uh, uh, Anjal has, has said a while ago about nostalgia, nostalgia is very important, like for, for the family, for the person who, uh, who had these uh, uh, this uh, childhood place, uh, ancestral place that had to leave behind. Nostalgia is very important for them. But when we are talking about when two states had been formed and people are shaped with and, uh, within the status and nationalist domain, people's identity had a new turn and new shape. Nostalgia often put a gloss on a lot many things. 
like nationalist and statist uh, dilemmas are there. Nationalist and statist, uh, uh, one of the major result of partition is India appeared as to be the superpower in the region. And that has consequences with India's relation with Bangladesh, with Pakistan. So this is interesting why we don't consider this as the prolonged aftermath of partition, why the prolonged aftermath of partition is only confined to the exodus of uh, certain population from certain land. So this is very important. These are the areas, and that's why I kind of provoke, in a, in a provoke not me, actually, it was Anunna Jahanara to be. She, uh, in her book, used the term Indocentric approach, and I uh, qualified the term in my work, uh, in my book. Uh, so it was like, partition so far had been treated in a very indocentric way. So anything outside that do not match with India's uh, uh, like indocentric approach was often disregarded, but were, was often remained left out. So I think these are the areas that we really should take uh, care of. Professor, I bring Sarah in, you know, because uh, essentially, I mean, here I have a vested interest in bringing you in. And jump right in, Sarah, because you know you are the millennial, uh, along with Anshar, in this in this evening. So let's bring you in, and you know you've heard Professor Niaz, you've heard Vidhu Parna, you've heard Professor Said uh, talk about various aspects of partition. But you, as a you know, in fact, a sort of a third generation inheritor of partition memories and legacy, in a way, in the same way as Anshar, in her own way. Uh, could you ask? Uh, could you express your thoughts, ask of Professor Said, Professor Nian, or Rikuparna, or present your thoughts to the audience as you, as you see? This is where you jump in. Thank you so much, Vidha. Um, and thank you, sir. Everything you were saying actually reminded me, took me back to what Ashal said initially that, you know, partition memories are personal memories. Um, yes, there is nostalgia, but there are also other parts of history that need to be looked at objectively. For younger, for younger generations like us, we encounter these bits of history through textbook, uh, textbooks through our classrooms. And I was just thinking while I was listening to all of you, I can't recall studying a lot of partition history from when I was in school. 71 has always been a big part of, of school curriculum, but I couldn't recall anything. Um, and so I actually had a question for Niaz, ma'am, if we could come back to you. Uh, one of the main ways in which the younger generations get to learn about history, as Dr. Roy said, is through literary texts. So how is partition being taught um, in our English departments or you know, just among our students in Bangladesh? <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Sarah, for that question. Uh, and let me go back a few years. Um, um, a, a, very, a very personal um, confession, uh, uh, the reason I um, took up the study of um, partition novels, uh, the Asiatic Society of Bangladesh, the Bangladesh Asiatic, Asiatic Society of Bangladesh had called for proposals for research. And they were going to give a, you know, a handsome amount of um, a, a stipend. And um, I took the opportunity to apply. And the, reason, and the reason I applied was I am, uh, and I have to explain here that Anchal, you are not only Punjabi here. There are ethnicities and there are nationalities. I am a Bangladeshi citizen, but I am Punjabi and I am Chinese and I am Irani, okay? So I have, and this was true of many people, you know, in India when, when we lived together. Now, my husband was a Bengali from Kolkata, a refugee, and he was a very, very strong Bengali. And um, when my first, son was born, this was before 71. He said, you have to talk to the child in Bangla. I said, I don't know Bangla. How can I talk to a, my child in a language which is not mine? 
which I have not heard from my mother. But he was just two years older than me, but he was you know, very, very dominant, unfortunately. And I struggled. I, at that time, I actually um, knew only one nursery, well, one, one, you know, Mini Baba Nini Makanoti Chini. I didn't know any Bengali um, lorries. And um, in 71, I became very angry. I was a Punjabi married to a Bengali. And to whom did my loyalties belong? Did my loyalties belong to the Pakistani soldiers who were chasing us? And yes, I was chased twice in a single day. Uh, or did my, and, and I, I, I did, I, I hardly knew any words of Punjabi, unfortunately. I couldn't have conversed with them. Did my loyalties lie with the Bengalis? Now, two Bengalis who know me, I am not a Bengali. When I go to Pakistan, I am a Bengali. So, my so, so in seventy one, I was very angry, and I consciously gave up all my connection to Urdu. I had taken Urdu in senior Cambridge. I had taken Urdu in intermediate. I had taken Urdu and hard Urdu in B. But in 71, I consciously gave up that language. When the Asiatic Society asked for research proposals, I asked myself this question. By this time, my husband's hold on me and listened. And I said, the language has not done me any harm. I am not fighting against the language. And I would like to see how people who write in English, people who write in Bangla, people who write in Urdu, people who write in Punjabi, I can't read Punjabi, but I read uh, a novel through translation. I want to see how these different linguistic and ethnic groups view the same episode. And I applied for that fellowship. I did not get it. But having put the abstract together, I did struggle. I bought books from different places. They were very difficult to get. Bangla books were very difficult to get. I was looking for a book. And the only copy was with the writer, Nongur by Abu Rush. The only copy was with him. I could not find a copy in the library. And he lent me his copy. And when I went to the bookshops asking for uh, Bangla books, they said, read Shunil Gongopadha. Why do you want to bother with these um, hopeless East uh, Bengali writers? So I studied, you know, uh, Bangla, the Bangla novels. I read the, uh, the Pakistani novels. I, I read, well, in, in uh, Kushwan Singh wrote in English. And um, that was, why I took up the study of the novels. And I saw that they all look at the same event, but through different perspectives. And sometimes they are silent. And it's not only the Bengali who is silent. You know, Kulratul and Haider has written this wonderful novel, Aad Kadarya, an epic. And she wrote it when she was in Pakistan. She was there for a short time. And for the chapter on 1947, she only writes Hindustan, Unniso, um, what would you say in Urdu? I forget. Um, what, 47, anyway, nine, Hindustan 1947. She doesn't say anything about it. I had the opportunity to meet her when she was still alive. And the first thing she told me, I will not talk politics with you. So if you don't talk politics, what else is there to talk about? You don't go to a writer to talk about, you know, how many kamizes do you have? How many um, bangles do you own? You don't. You want to talk about her books. So, you know, this elision of partition is true for many writers for very different reasons. And um, um, uh, Professor Said, you made a comment which I would just like to add on and then I'll shut up and then I do have to leave because I have been 
um, you know, at this unstable, with this unstable internet, um, you know, conducting a class by phone, uh, conducting a class when the, yeah, like, uh, there, there are lots of things I could talk about. I could go on, I could continue for a long time if I would. You know, this new identity, Professor Said, that you talk about, in, um, there is, um, there are two novels. Um, there is, one is um, the novel by uh, Abul Fazl, uh, Ranga Prabha, and the other novel is the novel by Abu Rush. Now, neither of these has been translated. And, uh, and in, uh, you know, in, in uh, Ranga Prabha, you know, like you can, you can translate it into a golden dawn or a bright dawn, um, there is this, um, there's, a, there's this love affair between um, a, a, a Hindu woman and a Muslim man. And um, the, no, the novel ends with um, uh, this comment that um, uh, Pakistan uh, is, um, it is possible in Pakistan um, to have, um, um, you know, um, socialism. And I will just quote from, uh, I will, uh, this is in translation, um, Abul Fazl he was, you know, he wrote Ranga Prabha. Uh, and at the end of the novel, uh, there's this uh, Hindu woman Maya and a Muslim woman come uh, and a Muslim man come on. Uh, they are in love, and um, they watch the sun rising on the beach. And Maya talks about Islam and socialism. And this is uh, what uh, she says. And I have translated the lines. Uh, still, your religion is the religion of the desert. Its nature is to make everything one. Even though you think of communism as your enemy, your religion is based on the ideal of socialism. I also want to talk about Mongol anchor, which is about um, you know, a, a, a person from Kolkata who leaves his family behind in Kolkata and comes to, um, it was I think called East Bengal at that time. It got the, uh, the name East Pakistan later. And he comes to Dhaka and uh, there are, you know, chapters where he expresses his disappointment with, uh, with Dhaka, you know, Dhaka is so much dirtier, you know, you can't, um, you know, get a glass, uh, a decent lemonade here. And he, he misses Kolkata, there is this nostalgia uh, of missing Kolkata. But um, there is a comment that he makes. Uh, and I, I and again, I quote, I, I'm translating the quotation. Um, and this is about the new identity. Pakistan, uh, and in, in the, you know, in, in, in the books written in the 60s, as I mentioned earlier, there is this question of this, um, uh, you know, this commonality with um, the, uh, the Bengali of West Bengal uh, and the East Bengali of East Pakistan, and the difference between the East Pakistani and um, the West Pakistani. Uh, but in Nongon, the narrator says, and I, uh, this is a translation, Pakistan was necessary for me to understand that the entire world is mine. But that does not mean that I will cut myself off from my entire past. That is the common past. My unique identity is inseparably made up of my past, present, and future. So I'll stop there talking about this new identity and about, uh, you know, uh, sort of the, the hope that uh, the creation of this new land would, um, uh, this, this hope that the people who came to this new land or who found that they were in a new land that they had. And of course they were, unfortunately, they would be disappointed. Um, I, I'll stop there and I, I you, uh, please allow me to leave because as I've said that I have had a difficult day uh, with the load shedding and uh, with being uh, on duty from 10 o'clock to 4.30. And thank you very much to you lab and to Shudeep and Sarah for inviting me. And I am uh, really happy to be on this panel with all these distinguished speakers. Thank you.
and may thank you all so keep well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for making time for us and thank you for um fascinating conversation. I think we're all grateful for it. Um, it was wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure and a great learning for all of us. Thanks so much, so very much. Um, Anshal, while Niaz ma'am was speaking, I saw you taking notes. You were, you know, like really listening to her, nodding your head. And it reminded me of how your book sounds. When I was reading Remnants of a Separation, I wrote about this. I reviewed uh, Remnants of a Separation, Anshal's first book. I co well, I co-wrote the review when it came out. Um, and this is something I focused on that one can really visualize you taking these interviews, having these conversations when we're reading your book, which was one of my favorite parts about favorite things about your book. Um, so could you tell us about your experience of taking some of these interviews? It must not be easy to talk about these things and ask people to relive, you know, um, memories that might have been traumatic as well, or memories that took place such a long time ago. So could you give us some, tell us about some anecdotes? Thanks for that question. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that you, when you are conducting oral history interviews with a generation that has, has witnessed that kind of trauma and violence and has lived with that memory for decades, sometimes practicing silence, you realize very quickly that the interview is not about you. So even though you may be the one sitting there and asking the questions and uh, aiding the exhumation of a story that has not seen light yet, it has nothing to do with you. So how you feel, how difficult it is for you will dawn on you much later. So I, as I mentioned, I was quite young when I started doing this work. So my first problem really was how can I ever relate to someone talking about something I have never seen and may never see, I hope, in my lifetime. And um, I think that uh, there is difficulty with descendants on how to ask the questions as well, because we don't really have a vocabulary of trauma that we have developed over these many decades, which seems strange for countries really born from trauma. So how do you ask the question? So I'll give you an example with my own grandparents. There were so many things in my mind. Um, what are topics I can approach? Can I use the word Pakistan? Can I call Pakistan home? Um, can I call them refugees? Because that's really what their identity was post-1947. They even lived in refugee camps for nearly a decade in Delhi. Um, so it was really how to start building a vocabulary to ask questions. And then the second thing is, um, not everyone wants to speak, even though they may have committed to speak about the event. So understanding that some people may have more or less to tell you and where the threshold of your questioning may lie but I think it was, it's incredible to listen to people who have lived through such traumatic times, holding on to those memories, talking about things other than violence. And I think this point was made earlier also that the landscape of partition cannot remain just a landscape of violence because that's just one landscape. And it is a dominating landscape and one that is uh, propagated and perpetuated by Bollywood and media and films and nationalism and it is easy dichotomy of us versus them but there is so much more so in these conversations there are innumerable mentions not just of like people who lived side by side or for mostly in harmony but also the similarities that still remain the desire the longing to go back to one's soil uh, the friend that was left behind the girlfriend that was left behind the people that reunited in the camp the objects carried the food that was missed the entire lifestyles that changed after partition and I think that this kind of cultural and social ethnography of people's lives was equally as important to archive but I think the difficulty, because you mentioned that, when I, when I was speaking to people, when you sit with them three, four, five hours at a time, uh, you're really aiding them to talk as much or as little as they want to. And then later, what really got to me was when you're listening to the interviews and transcribing and translating, and you're listening to the words that they are saying, and you're listening to the very unique phrases they are using that are born from a particular historical context of them having survived this trauma, 
that the enormity of the trauma dawns on you. And you start thinking really the, the extent. And I think that's when it really got to me. It's the voices that don't leave for me and the voices that remain most important for me. And I think um, digressing onto a little bit of a different point, um, how that memory passes through the generations because Shudeep made a point about us being millennials as well. And this is something that I've become very interested in in the last several years. How is memory inherited? How is it bequeathed? And how does it mean different things to different descendants in the three nations that were once part of the empire? And I want to give a small anecdote. Um, I was conducting an interview a couple of years ago with a woman that was not much older than me. She was Pakistani and she lived in America. And her um, grandparents had migrated from parts of UP and Bihar to what became East Pakistan in 47. And then the family had subsequently migrated to Pakistan proper uh, after 1971. And so she is telling me memories that she has inherited from both these migrations. She says things like, for my father who was born in Calcutta, everything after Calcutta was temporary and things like that. But now towards the end of our conversation, um, she mentions this tiny little fact. She says, and bear in mind, she's Pakistani, I'm Indian, and the land that she's talking about will soon become Bangladesh. She says, uh, my parents met because of partition. And I said, well, no, how is that possible? You you are in your 30s, I'm in my 30s. How, how can your parents have met because of partition? Because for me, partition is 47. She says, uh, no, they met because of partition. You know, he was her tutor. And I said, you mean the secondhand memory of partition? They both had memories from their parents of partition. She says, no, no, they lived through the partition of 1971. And, you know, now, as I'm saying this with retrospect, it sounds ridiculous, but at the time I was incredibly confused, but it hit me after a few seconds. And I remember this conversation in my head. I said, of course, you are Pakistani. So, and I am Indian. And I'm really measuring my words here in this conversation. And so I say, you are Pakistani and I'm Indian and she's nodding. And I said, well, naturally 1971 is a partition for you. And then we are both quiet and, from this quiet, she asked me, well, what is, you know, and I'm replaying our entire conversation now, what have I misunderstood because of the particular legacy of partition that I as an Indian have inherited and what the border has met out to us in these three different nations. So I'm thinking what I have misunderstood throughout this entire conversation now. And she asked me, well, if 1971 is not partitioned to you, then what is it? And I said, well, it's, I mean, it's the third India-Pakistan war. And, you know, and it just gets you thinking that if a single date, a single year that impacts three nations is not understood in, a, in, in one way and, and it provides its own multi uh, kind of tributary like legacies. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I keep thinking what it means for the future and how many more kind of understandings we will have of, of a shared past. So if 1971 is independence for Bangladesh, it is partition for Pakistan and, and the third India-Pakistan war for us. Um, and of course in India, yes, as it was rightly said, it is a very India-centric conversation. So for me, this was really uh, enlightening. And I, I, I'm really mindful now when I do these, not just multi-generational interviews, but also multi-hyphenated interviews, interviews that have gone through several decades of identities borrowed and created uh, along the way. Thank you so much, uh, Atra. That was a fascinating, fascinating. I, I had a question to answer. Can I ask a question to answer? Oh, no. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, Anjan, I was interested to know, uh, was there any qualitative difference when you were for example, interviewing your grandmother and somebody you didn't know? It's extremely hard to interview your family. They are extremely rigid. Uh, but the one interesting thing that uh, my, my grandmother told me that no other interviewee ever made me think about was what happens to the interviewee after we ask them 
questions. And I've started to think a lot about the ethics of the interview and um, the repercussions of the interview because uh, I asked my grandmother this question that I posed it in fact, I said that uh, in 47, when you were staying in Kingsway camp in Delhi, if someone like me, an old historian or a journalist was walking around asking questions with a notepad and saying, how did you feel? What happened? Do you want to unburden? Uh, would you have wanted to talk to someone? And she very outrightly said, no. And I said, isn't that what we're doing right now? Like for years and years, I've been asking you questions. And she said, well, I, I answer because you ask. But when you ask, do you think about what happens to the person who's relaying them? And I had honestly never thought about that. When we ask questions as oral historians, as interviewers, as people have, you know, people that are trying to preserve the past, we ask our questions and we leave. And then what happens to the psyche of the interview? Do they go back to that time? Is there lightness? Is there uh, some sense of closure? Because I have seen closure and lightness for sure, but I have also seen equal parts heaviness or people saying, but I don't want to talk anymore or enough is enough. So I really think about what these questions do to history that has been silenced sometimes consciously for many years. But your question, yes, of course, it, there is a difference in interviewing your family. It changes the way you perceive them. It changes the way you love them, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Um, you don't have that same baggage with strangers. And strangers open up far more easy. I mean, I'm generalizing, but for the most part, they always knew what I was there to do. They always knew that I would speak about partition, even though that may not have been the first thing we talked about. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy, for such an important question. I had a question for you. Actually, before that, actually, this is reminding me of a book that uh, Dr. Nay uh, Narnika Mukherjee wrote. She, you know, her work has to do with Virangonas. Um, and I remember she published um, I think a guideline, a graphic novel on what kind of responsibilities researchers and journalists take on and how you should go about taking interviews of people, survivors of sexual assault, survivors of any kind of um, historical trauma. So um, yeah, it just reminded me of that book. Um, Dr. Roy, I just have one question for you and then I think we can open up the floor to questions from the audience. Um, you, you, know, you mentioned how nothing quite does the job as well as tactile experiences you know it's one thing to read about it but it's completely different to see it in front of you so what goes into curating these memories of the partition could you tell us about that entire process uh actually that process is work in progress and still at a nascent phase uh i if i if, if i know this will sound very i don't know what but if you can just wait for 11 more days we are launching the virtual museum on the 24th so, uh, you know, I honestly cannot talk a lot more other than saying that we're going to launch it and that the visual element is going to be very strong. But as far as curating is concerned, um, you know, there is, as I said, the, uh, there is a focus on the art uh, in a way that is not usually done. So we are, uh, we, are very, uh, we are very clear about that, that obviously it's history and that we archival material, we are doing oral history project. So all that you can think of in terms of memorialization in a, in a museum will be there in a virtual form. Uh, but uh, we, we, will, we will place special emphasis on the arts. And that curation is an ongoing thing which is happening. In that it has its own challenges, of course. Yes. I know this is a very inadequate answer, but please forgive me for this. Thank, thank you so much. Um, we actually are streaming this live on the ULAB Facebook page and the Daily Star Facebook page. So if, you know, to our audience who are watching online or, you know, those of you who are here, you can go back and look at the Facebook page. Where we've been posting the links to uh, Achal's website, the Museum of Material Memory and the Kolkata, uh, Kolkata Parish Museum and the reviews of their books. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and, you know, go back there and look, uh, look at the link. Um, Audience, if we have, you know, if any of you are interested in asking any questions. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your great talk. 
this sort of thing to be giving a kind of natural touch. I think so far. And that's why I'm here. So the point question is that we hear about partition, we hear about the great things, like maybe putting down several families. And then this side maybe server though we don't hear the names nowadays. My question is that where the common people visited, they really sacrifice, they suffer, they migrated, and uh, I mean they have gone through all those that we did. And even in 1970, that happened too. So if we don't find common people anywhere, maybe in some documentary standing on the show, maybe in the written part of the films we find those things. But in the great books, I mean, I have read a few books, I am not a great reader, but I haven't found that. Like, most probably I have read a uh, great partition book, sort of Yasmin Khan, or something they have heard, so I have heard. And so I haven't found those things. Sir. And even, even in the television, I'm just linking those things. I don't know if you understand me that. Uh, like, farmers have done a lot for 19, for uh, uh, 71, and of course, in the 47 too. But the thing is that in, in television media, we see any economic program or any economic report. The economics great economists come over here and they give their view, but we don't find any farmers over here who really speak in that. And I have talked with many farmers. The way they talk completely something different from the road grading. So what's your insight on that? Really get to hear from this. Thank you. Anyone? Please it's for anyone. So Professor, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, I would definitely like to hear also from Ritpurna and Anshul as well. Uh, this is, um, I think you are absolutely right that mostly it was about uh, big men and big, big uh, parties like, uh, and big history, meta history was all about that. Political history was all about that. But then there comes the uh, social history and cultural history. And there, thanks to the literary genre, like the fictions and films, you can really hear the perspectives for, uh, from the grassroots uh, in those creative genre. But you are true in the academic practice, like particularly in the works of the historians of political scientists, it's all about big names and big, uh, big uh, parties. However, over the decades, things have changed, like thanks to the uh, feminist oral historians on partition studies, uh, like uh, Ritu Menon, Kabla Vasin, and then uh, Vina Das, they actually had contributed a lot, particularly focusing on Punjab partition, bringing up the experiences of women and narratives and accounts of women that challenges, often refutes, often uh, like uh, critically, uh, like dismantled uh, the edifice of the nationalist and statist canonical narratives and accounts. So these things are there, and particularly my work, I, I am an anthropologist, so my, and uh, I can see anthropologists uh, to be a storyteller and story collector, actually. So I actually interviewed people at the grassroots, and then I consult the interviews with the archives. So in archive, you will find the statists and nationalist heroes and villains and accounts and big names and big actors. But then I'm interviewing and I'm, I'm trying to reflect it and trying to match the narratives from the grassroots, from their mundane life, from their mundane non-happenings. Like partition or history is all about happening. Big history, political history is all about happening. Big incidents, big heroic, uh, like a war or something. But then there is this huge aspect of mundane everyday, non-happenings, experiences of the ordinary people. So these things are already there. And I'm sure that 
if you look into the recent works in partition literature, partition studies, you will find a completely new, like Angel's work, like she's interviewing, she's not interviewing any big names, like ordinary people. So, and their experiences. So, when historians or oral historians or anthropologists are bringing up their perspectives, they are actually uh, bringing up that, like the feeble, uh, like, uh, like the uh, unheard, so far unheard voices of the uh, nameless, uh, faceless uh, people often disregarded at the, or considered at the margin of the history. And now, social historians, oral historians, cultural historians uh, are bringing this up. But in Bangladesh, still, the academia in political science and history is still very nationalist status and still looking into the big event and big names and not going beyond that. This is very important. Like in Bangladesh, about 71, there is this fascinating novel by Shahin Akhtar, Talash, bringing up the experiences of the Virangalas. No uh, parallel work is done among the uh, uh, in the academia from among the scholars. No parallel of that work is there. So this is interesting. Like in one in uh, one way, academia is failing and confining themselves to the comfortable genre, uh, canonical voice of state and nation. On the other hand, outside the academia, in the creative genre, people are working. And in recent new scholarships, also there are the new challenges uh, with like small voices from small people. Yeah. So I think uh, Anjal and Bhutaparna, you got the gist of uh, the question that was asked from the audience uh, with Professor Saeed's reply. But essentially what it was about is that uh, the question was uh, concern really, uh, which was expressed that partition history or history in general talks about big people and big events, and they forget the little people and the mundane everydayness of events that Professor Said mentioned. So, uh, and Professor Said insisted that Anjana and Ritu Bernard, uh, your, um, your process are heard, so go right ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, if if you will allow me, I just want to add on to what Professor Said said, said that, you know, if you look at the partition, if you look at partition historiography, the shifts from the 80s, I just want to take two minutes to talk about it. And I want to mention a few books here. Some has already been mentioned. So, you know, the first major shift was in the 80s from national to regional histories. So, Yan Talbot was doing it for Punjab. Joy Chatterjee was doing it for Bengal. And then there was this major shift in the 90s with the feminist turn in historiography, as he said, Rituman and Kamla Mahasin, Urvashi Butalia. And there has been others, for example, caste, Shekhar Bandhavatha's work on caste. And obviously border, border making his own work, as he said, Willem van Schendel, uh, and that is continuing. Uh, one of the most recent works on borders is like Malini Shum's Jungle Passports, for example. Uh, and then there has been, uh, you know, the politics of border making, okay, in the Punjab, like uh, Bazira Zamindar, uh, also diaspora studies. The latest book, which was is a couple of years old now, Anu Jele, uh, Claire Alexander, and Joya Chatterjee, The Bengal Diaspora, Rethinking Muslim uh, Migration, is it really throws new light and uh, it talks about this, about something that uh, Professor mentioned earlier, that, you know, we only think of migration, but there is also that story of immobility, people who did not leave. And uh, I would like to say another thing that, you know, this, uh, uh, this oral history part, this has been there for a long time, actually, from, from the feminist turn, we have had it, but it gained in currency. So in post-millennial years, we have to remember the work of Gunita Singh Bhalla 1947 partition archive. It has done a phenomenal job of opening up this entire repository of stories that was previously untapped, some thousands of interviews, uh, which was made available and accessible uh, to the public through social media. I think that was a very important turning point. And, uh, you know, uh, historians had done oral history before, but it was still for a very long time, still a disciplinary exercise. What the partition archive did was it threw open uh, the field to citizen historians to honor the people's history. And then uh, in the last decade, we've also seen a new and very subjective turn in memory studies in the work of Anunna Jahanura Kabir, 
uh, he just mentioned partitions, post-amnesias, and a resounding demonstration of the power of material memory in the work of Anchal. So, you know, there has been this uh, uh, work uh, uh, on Tripura and Assam, Tripura especially of Anindita Ghoshal, uh, for Andaman and Nikobar Islands, Uditi Shen. So there has been a lot of work uh, which throws open the field, which brings in other experiences. And I also would like to say something that the interest in memorialization, you know, there has been a resonance about it in India at the same, almost at the same time, uh, Punjab and Bengal. I mean, Punjab led the way with the Amritsar Museum. We still have, we still don't have a place of our own. It's not physical yet, but there has been a resonance uh, of the idea. And I think it kind of builds upon uh, these other trends that has been developing over the last 15, 20 years. So yes, the field has really opened up a lot. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roy, can you hear us now? We actually, the, we had a power cut, so we couldn't hear the last few lines of what you said. We could, we could see you speaking. We didn't catch it. You, 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 you look just wonderful with the burner. Oh okay. my God. <laughs> you were so insightful though. I, I was nodding. I heard everything. Okay, no, so uh, can you just say what, what is the last thing you heard? <laughs> Just the last two to three lines, I think. Just, oh, the, no, so basically I just said there is a resonance uh, in the subcontinent about memorialization. So in 1971, war already has a museum like in Dhaka, uh, which is about the 71 war. And, uh, but th there has been no partition memorialization of the 1947. And it happened more or less at the same time. So the Amritsar Museum has happened in 2017, 18. And we have been thinking around the same time. So what I was trying to say is that, you know, uh, I think it builds upon the work that has happened the last 10, 15 years of opening up history, if I can put it in just one phrase. I think this is a very critical moment uh, in, the in the subcontinent as far as a uh, public engagement with history is concerned. So I see our work as a part of a greater, a part of a wider effort, which is happening. Yeah. I think also to democratize the telling of history as well. And I mean, <clears throat> as, as the question was very rightly put, move it from the large age histories, the corridors of history to really the people who the decisions percolated to and were impacted by small age histories. Another book that I actually found. I very must have looked very, very odd, you know, like speaking. No, you look wonderful with the burden. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? We can take one more. One more question. You see this reluctance to discuss partition until with the partner and professor's side. You know, so uh, Professor Chamsad has a question. Go ahead. Jewish identity concept and how telling lives 
is important for a nationality. And because you are dealing with uh, personal benefits, uh, how do you negotiate you know, so this idea of authenticity and the idea of authenticity when somebody is claiming uh, story as this? Go right ahead. Did you hear the question before my answer? I am not. Okay, this is about negotiating authenticity. When you're looking to set up, a, I'm just sort of compressing uh, Professor Shamsad's question to the two of you. He, he basically inquiring it from the perspective of the sort of a Holocaust memorial or memorializing uh, a certain past in a way, authentically. So how do you negotiate the, the barriers of authenticity that come to you? Because people are throwing facts as they perceive it. People are throwing stories as, as they remember. So how do you, both of you, as memorialists, as archivists in your own way, negotiate that aspect of what to take as authentic and how do you gauge what is authentic? Because after all, you transfer that authenticity further down the line, if you will, to make to create an authentic history in your own way, uh, an authentic archive in your own way. I think that is what uh, the question, the root of the question is. So I think both of you can answer this in your own ways because both of you are pressing it in your own ways. I'll also hear from Sir afterwards. Right. Uh, yeah. Anshul, yes, right. would you like to go first? I've already spoken about it. Sure. Um, so the veracity of memory is something that uh, oral historians get confronted with a lot given the nature of our work. Um, one way is, as Professor Said said, um, to augment what you are recording with archival information, the historical archive, which is something that oral historians have to do at any point in time. Uh, and at some point, um, instances from your interviews may be found in those archives. For example, if someone did mention of a particular riot at a particular, uh, on a particular date, uh, you may be able to find mentions of that in a historical archive, but there will always be instances where you can't because people just remember such specific nuanced stuff. Uh, the memory of the survivor is not vague. It is incredibly nuanced. So they may, they may not know, they may not be able to say, I migrated in the month of say November, but they'll say Maggar ke mahine mein, like the, the month equivalent to them which you may be able to translate then what is that in the uh, English calendar, things like that. But the other really interesting way I have found to authenticate histories, particularly histories that don't find mention in national, regional, or really any archive, is to corroborate them with other stories from the area. So I, I'll give you an example. Several years ago, I recorded some interviews with I recorded a single interview first of a woman who had migrated from a place called Mirpur, which is now in Pakistan. It is um, in Kashmir in Pakistan. And the interview was horrific, like horrific to the extent of the number of family members that had been murdered, had been taken to a concentration camp in a place called Ali Beg to a Gurdwara. Um, women who had been returned a year or so after partition, like the details were just so gruesome. And I couldn't imagine, I mean, I couldn't believe that something like this, I couldn't find mention of it anywhere in any archive. And where it found mention was in the stories of other people from the same region. So that interview led me to record more stories from the Mirpur region, particularly with Hindus and Sikhs who had migrated and come to India settled in parts of Jammu, settled in parts of Jaipur, relocated to various places across the country where there were large refugee camps being made, uh, Kurukshetra, for example. Uh, and all their stories were near identical, identical to the dates, identical to the instances of violence, identical even to the kind of violence, identical to the places that they were sent, identical to the camps. And it was, it was like an entire regional history had been wiped out from national memory. And there is not a lot of work done with Meepuris. There is work done with Meepuris in the UK where they made a significant, uh, where they're significant in population because they migrated uh, subsequently. Uh, a lot of them migrated to the UK, but in India, 
the history of Hindu and Sikh Meepuri Kashmiri is, just wasn't known. And the only way I could have corroborated is by listening to other stories from the region. But I think with oral history, you will always encounter that question. Can we trust memory? Uh, there is a story that I've heard and I don't remember who told it, where um, there's a Hindi Bollywood film, Gadar, uh, and maybe people have seen it, maybe they haven't, but it, it, it's centered around partition. And in Gadar, there is a scene where on a train, there is a message written in blood. And now someone, I can't recall who, said that they had interviewed a survivor who mentioned that they had seen a train with the same words written in blood. Now, has that survivor seen the movie Gadar and sort of transposed that memory onto them? Or was the Gadar scene inspired by an actual train which had the words written in blood? I always, that's why I mentioned earlier, I wonder how much collective memory informs and shapes personal memory as well uh, of survivors. So I think that we may always encounter this question of how, I don't like to say it like that because part of my job is trusting people's memories and saying, this is the, this is the lacuna this is the void we haven't been able to fill with, with archival history. So we are, we are seeking your memory. We are seeking, you will fill that gap. But yes, there, this, this is always a question. Can, how much of it is the truth and how much can you trust? Definitely and unfortunately. Rituparna, if you want to jump in. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I just don't want to, you know, repeat what happened. Uh, so yes, uh, Anchal was uh, talking about her experience as oral historian. We are trying to put together a museum. Obviously, museum has a lot more things. Uh, so here it is, it has an overall vision, of course, which is uh, primarily that of the architect to begin with as a, as a physical space, the way you, know, the way you design the space itself uh, speaks a lot about uh, what you're trying to do. But also there is this multiplicity and multitudinosity of resources. And I would like to, I, the way I see it personally, is that I see these resources as voices. For example, I'll give you one example. Uh, we just talked about, I think Professor Pirdosa, we said about 1946, you know, not many people talk about 1940, which is so true. For example, uh, when we're trying to say, talk about 1946, what do we do? We have so many kinds of resources with us. And they all have their own truth. So a Margaret Burke White photograph, which is extremely famous of vultures feeding on dead bodies. That is one truth, photographic truth, the reality. A statesman report on it, maybe. A textbook section on that. I have a personal memory. My grandfather's thesis was lying in a uh, lay in Kolutala lane in College Street. His thesis got burned because the entire Muslim shop was burned. I have a personal memory. There is this film called Hey Ram uh, by uh, Kamal Hassan, uh, where uh, direct action day, you know, it's a very long sequence. Uh, I don't know why in, uh, any documentary has not been made, but if you're talking of 1940, there are, there are literary representations, once again, not too many. So while we are dealing with 1946, we are going to marshal in all these resources, uh, which have different truths to them. So there is no one, uh, so authenticity is once again, you know, there is a subjective dimension, especially when it comes to arts, there is a subject dimension to it. Our duty, I think, is to marshal as many different kinds of resources, different kinds of experience on that same event that we can get hold of, I think. Uh, okay, uh, you have the last word. Okay, yes. <laughs> my privilege. Uh, Professor Samsa Montes uh, has this wonderful question. This actually uh, touches up the crucial issue of uh, representativeness and authenticity. This is a methodological question for oral historian or anthropologist. Like, uh, and I believe that there will be inaccuracy, no memories could be complete, and memory and forgetness is not uh, like uh, opposite to each other. Like in recent days, oral history, many of the oral historians used to think that amnesia is just another version of memory. 
So this is important, like, and what memory triggers you? Like past is not a past. You grab a past, you bring up a particular past. You select a particular past and bring it up in a particular, standing on a particular present. So every memory is an act of selection, act of choice, and that is related. So when I'm asking my quote unquote Bihari interviewer about what happened in 71, why would he say that to me? Because I am a Bengali Muslim. And historically we were rival on 71 and that had consequences up in their life over the decades, over the last five decades. Why would they be honest to me? And why would they say that, okay, this happened then? And it, it's similar with the uh, non-Muslims, like the Hindus, when you talk about 47, what happened to them? Uh, how was your neighbors, how they treat you? Why do you say that real? So this, there will be hiding, there will be selection, there will be inaccuracy, there will be loss of memory, there will be uh, nationalist status gloss over your memory, appropriation of the grand narratives of the state and nation. But on this, uh, the task for the oral historian and uh, anthropologist is to uh, some some of them uh, make there are two kind of uh, like uh, approaches. Some actually think that this is what people say, and I'm not going to interfere into that. I leave my interpretation separate, and this is their interpretation. Some would say like after telling a story, some would go for possible explanations possible interpretations. So this is all about interpretation. And particularly in anthropology until 1960s, there was this uh, uh, like thrust to attain objectivity or one fact, one truth about society. But then after 60s, things have changed in anthropology. Uh, anthropologists realize that anthropology is more like literature not like science, so not like acu historical accuracy. And history is not neutral. If you read the Hundred Years War history from the French perspective, and if you read it from the British perspective, that if you read the history of 71 from Pakistani perspective, and you read it from Bangladeshi perspective, it will be different. So this is all about perspective, subjectivity. So the task for the order, my task, as I understand, make the best case, make the best, make the best uh, interpretation, try to make a best, best interpretation and just leave it like that. This is, I understand the story is this and I understand from that, that this may be this, this may be that, this may be even that. So, and often many would not be happy with those who prefer to one, listen, one solution, one truth, one fact, they may not find it. If I ask the audience today to describe the, uh, the narrative, the event this, uh, this evening, 30 people will bring up with 30 unique interpretations. So, and this is the task of, this is the beauty of oral history. Hugely challenged by the mainstream historians, hugely challenged by the political historians, but oral history has its strength, lies its strength in subjectivity. And so it will be there. I, I think this has been an absolutely stunning evening of uh, reflection, of contemplation, of discussion, and sharing of truths and perspectives and personal histories and institutionalized histories. And I, I frankly, I've been in Dhaka now for uh, nearly six months, and and this has been, a, for me, absolutely top of the pops uh, in terms of an intellectual, historical literary discussion on perspectives of any sort. And we've discussed partition in so many forms and perspectives. I don't, I'm sure you agree with this. Uh, uh, I, I need to, Sarah to say thanks to our wonderful, wonderful guests. But before she gets, Sarah traditionally, Anshil and Rituparna, you'd be happy to know, always gets the last word in, in, in all our literary salons. This has been a tradition, uh, ongoing tradition, and it will continue. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you all personally because Sarah has her last word. It, it's been, personally speaking, it's been an absolutely stunning evening of revolution and learning for me. So thanks very much for joining us. Sarah, you have the last word. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs>
Um, thank you once again to all of our guests. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Atra. Thank you, Dr. Ruth Kornaroy. Uh, it was wonderful to have Professor Niyaz Zaman. Whenever conversations about partition come up, I've personally noticed this. Whenever I've interviewed or reviewed something, the conversation goes on and on. It's very difficult to stop. And that was the case today as well. Um, so thank you to our audience as well. And also I'd like to mention Bookworm Bangladesh and Ula Press who are here with their books. Um, so if you're interested in partition literature, we have novels, short story collections, history books uh, here for sale. Please also proceed to the lobby area where we have some light snacks for all of you. And, and I'm sorry, Anshadan Ritu Gordon, you can't join us yes. for the night refreshment and snacks, but you, you can vote for the God, you can pray to the gods of Dhaka Literature Festival, which will uh, hopefully take place in January 2023 to bring you over and then We'll personally take you out for refreshments and tea and coffee. Oh, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. Thank you so much. You have a good evening. Really. Lovely to have you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank um, you all. And so we'll be back. We're back every month with one Lit Salon event. So um, we'll be back next month again. Hopefully, we'll see all of you here with us. Thank you so much and have a good evening.